Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start my video. So I can, oh, um, can, I don't know if I can start my video. It's okay. Um, so uh, yes, welcome. Welcome to our webinar. Welcome everyone. Um, I first want to say thank you to the National Foreign Language Resource Center at University of Hawaii for inviting me to present this webinar to you. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. So thank you very, very much. Uh, in anticipation of our Dig Deeper, uh, I have some materials that I would like to share with you. Um, you'll uh, read the article in the NECFL review, that's the um, um, Northeast Conference on Teaching Foreign Language. We had a special issue last year, Intercultural Competence Through World Languages, in February uh, 2017, that's when it came out. I did a, um, a large workshop there on using intercultural competence as curriculum framer, and I wrote the article. In that article, you will find, um, you'll find multiple uh, resources. There's uh, a template there, a sample template, which I'll talk a little bit about later, as well as other pieces that really will um, tie in everything that I'm going to talk about today. And the article is called Unpacking the Standards for Transfer into Cultural Competence by Design. Um, also, if you uh, take a look at the uh, revised uh, Necessful ACTFL can-do statements, those global statements, uh, and there's a nice article there in Language Educator. So I invite you to take a look at that before you do your Dig Deeper questions. Some of our uh, questions to discuss and consider and think about as we move on today is, how can backward design and understanding by design transcend planning from language performance goals. A lot of us know about uh, uh, those language performance goals that are language, that are linguistic, but how can we really use backward design and understanding by design to really transcend that and move forward? So I'm hoping today's discussion on um, in cultural, intercultural competence as curriculum framer uh, will help um, answer some of those questions. Next, how can planning backward enable transfer goals? We'll talk about transfer also in this, uh, in this uh, time together and uh, give you some ideas on how you can plan for transfer. And then lastly, intercultural competence unfolded by enduring understandings and essential questions is the key to an articulated curriculum. Discuss. So those are the three, uh, the three focus uh, questions and focus ideas for our Dig Deeper. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to talking a little bit more about that. So uh, let's get started. In looking at backward design, um, back in about 2003-2004, I uh, looked at, I saw that there was nothing for uh, world languages in terms of backward design, and I wanted to do something about that. So at that time, I aligned the national standards with understanding by design, and I looked at a intercultural curriculum framer in order to be able to do that. So in examining student learning objectives, I really think it needs to go all the way back to planning an articulated curriculum and doing so with intercultural competence in mind. Uh, intercultural competence truly aligns language skills and cultural knowledge and really makes seamless our goals of performance assessment. Cultural perspectives reflect values, beliefs, and attitudes of its people. These perspectives essentially create the practices and products that we experience. So therefore, by implementing tasks with these desired results, our learners really experience transferable skills that are within a cultural context rather than divorced from it. Articulation, and when I mean articulation, I mean between levels, buildings, and schools, whether it's 9 through 12, 7 through 12 or K through 12, that articulation of intercultural competence really is a lifelong process. So not just only when they're with you, but five to seven years down the line after they've left you, how can they continue to unpack these pieces of intercultural competence really for lifelong learning? It's a lifelong process and it should demonstrate progression over time in your curriculum through intentional assessment tasks in a variety of contexts that are relevant to intercultural competence goals. Many of you are probably familiar with the iceberg concept of culture. I like this one very much and I have the reference down below. It takes a look at, well, what's above the waterline is what are the tangible affects of culture and usually cultural products. And then down below, 
are what really are those cultural perspectives, those intercultural perspectives. What do you notice when you look at all of those below the waterline? Well, those are ones that are not seen, but are very, very important. These are the ones that we use to then develop big ideas and take a look at our themes and say, well, how does the culture or cultures treat this theme? How does it treat this throughout our cultures? Another thing you might notice is that we all have these. We all have these concepts. We all have these cultural perspectives. How it differs is how each culture then responds to it or speaks to it, but they're ones that we all have. So I use these in order to frame big ideas. These are, are, are big ideas for our intercultural perspectives and for our themes. I use these then to develop enduring understandings and then essential questions. This is what my teachers use in order to uh, develop their curriculum framer and then what they use to develop performance assessment tasks and those student learning objectives. So backward design really begins here. It begins here before we start thinking about, uh, about linguistic goals. The learning objectives start here, and what I, what I uh, will say, this is where we begin identifying desired results. So how do we do this? The themes and big ideas become our essential questions and our enduring understandings. These intercultural perspectives are truly the key piece to enduring understandings and questions. They're going to inform our transfer task. They're going to let us know what's really important, must-haves, non-negotiables in the culture that you want students to understand. And then these perspectives inform the practices of what they're able to do. So these will inform our tasks and the content that they're going to need to have and need to use in order to solve problems and create products. I think in terms of performance assessment tasks, we are all really asking our students to solve problems and create products that are relevant and important with value beyond the classroom. So what is a world language curriculum designed for intercultural competence? What does that look like? Well, again, we talked about an articulated curriculum. And again, an articulated curriculum is one where that moves between levels, buildings, and schools, where you can see that progression from the end that goes all the way back to the beginning. Again, whether it's 9 through 12, 7 through 12, or a K through 12 articulated curriculum. All the teachers that I work with report, well, we don't always know what's happening in other grades. Middle school doesn't know what high school's doing. High school may say, well, we have no idea what's happening in middle school and elementary school. This curriculum design really helps and ensures that articulation. So there's no question about what's happening before and aft. It does away with a lot of the, uh, a lot of the very difficult feelings and trials that teachers have in working with, another, with one another because this curriculum design really pushes the envelope and makes sure that everyone knows what's happening before and after. Why? Because the overarching cultural framer is on these pieces of intercultural competence. When that's there as the framer, then everything else falls into place because you're looking at how to see, you're looking at how to see what does the culture say and how does it respond vis-a-vis -vis these themes. And you unpack and you unfold these themes over time. You do so with the performance assessments. These really engage the learner in important transfer tasks that have variations, a complication to solve, in different contexts that really demonstrate a student's intercultural competence. What do we think about when we think about transfer? As you can see, all of these refer to things that we absolutely need as language learners. We need to be able to do tasks on our own. We have to be good risk takers. We have to involve ourselves in the complexity. We have to be able to solve that problem. It involves critical thinking skills. We need to use a variety within our repertoire and be very flexible. Uh, we need to show uh, that we can use language flexibly and securely. 
we're also put into situations that are unpredictable. Well, language is unpredictable all the time. The amazing thing about language and consequently its most dawning prospect is that we really don't know what's going to happen after we say something to somebody else. We can't be entirely sure, right? For way too long, our language learners were often attired in a costume of rules and lists, which no one's going to ask them to recite on any street corner, I promise you that. Um, maybe they carried a few cultural sound bites along the way, but everyone knows how really that turned out. Um, the only thing predictable about the real life act of language is how unpredictable it really is. So for that reason, we need to prepare tasks for our students that are unpredictable. So the best gift that we can really give our students is transfer. Uh, I first heard about transfer in 1999 from Grant Wiggins, may he rest in peace, and um, I sought to understand what Grant and others meant by transfer for all other content areas. So I apply transfer to world languages, and this is different from gradual release of responsibility. Um, this is uh, involving students in tasks that are entirely novel, uh, that are new to them, where they have to use a variety of their repertoire, again, flexibly and securely, and use it in a way different than they have originally learned it. So a good definition for, um, for transfer is the ability to use knowledge and skills in a different context, different from how it was originally learned, and to do it on one's own with very few to no cues or supports. So those, those uh, scaffolding training wheels are taken off, uh, and they're taken off um, because we want to make sure the only way you really know you learn something is if you can use it and apply it in a completely different way. Again, different from how you originally learned it. Uh, so I looked at transfer for world languages not only to the goals of the standards, but toward creative, original, and very purposeful language. Uh, and, whole, and again, for the goal of a self-directed, lifelong language user. And I call it turnarounds for transfer. In the article that you'll read, you hear me talk about it, and I also have another uh, article that I did for the Nell Journal uh, called uh, Turnarounds for Transfer. And um, I uh, got people together and said, well, let's take a tired textbook task or tasks even that you designed and go beyond the modes to invoke unpredictability and create opportunities for what I call the inevitable unexpected, because that's really what language uh, real language use is all about. We have to prepare students for that inevitable unexpected. Now consider this, when, when kids play games, when children play games, all of this comes into play. They have to set goals, they have to question, uh, they have to make decisions very quickly, they make choices, they achieve consensus, they have to observe others thinking, they have to um, come up with new ideas. Well, Performance assessment in the three modes of communication is really, truly uh, the blueprint, I think, for creating very meaningful and relevant transfer tasks. So we go beyond the modes when we create these tasks and simulation in order to reach those not only communication goals, but intercultural goals. Um, this is what sh children do when they play games, but actually, this is what happens in the world of work. So it's really incumbent upon us to create the kind of tasks that students are likely to find and likely to encounter in the real world, the kind of tasks that they might be asked to do in, uh, in a real life situation in the world of work uh, and in their life. Uh, and again, uh, novelty, always toward more novelty, things that they have not seen before. Using a language appropriately in a given culture, what does it require? Well, it requires high adaptability. You have to be able to change and deal with flex and flux all the time because, again, the situations are entirely unpredictable. You have to tolerate new situations that you haven't seen before and be able to take your repertoire and be able to use it uh, and solve a problem. You deal with incomplete information all the time. Not everything is given to you, certainly not. And uh, you have to be able to function with those gaps and solve problems without a whole lot of cues. So, because of this, we know that transfer doesn't occur by chance, and this is important. So uh, consider uh, someone going out there thinking they're going to get the apple, 
and uh, you know what ends up happening, you end up with the orange instead. So in planning for transfer, you're planning for what I call the inevitable unexpected. And one has to plan for the inevitable unexpected. Now, when you're looking at backward design, you're, you're yes, planning that summative performance assessment, the final performance assessment of the unit, and planning backward from there. So you know what that goal is going to look like. But for the students there in front of the curtain, they need to see that each, each of those smaller formative tasks along the way are more novel, they're more new until they get to that summative assessment they have not seen before. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about planning for that inevitable unexpected. Uh, it's why I say drills give the appearance of understanding but not the reality of transfer. So when language learning was dominated by drill mastery tasks, transfer won't happen on its own. Um, as a Grant used to say, he said, the sum of the drills does not equal the game. So when I'm talking about the game, I'm talking about there you are uh, in the real situation and all of those, all of those types of uh, drills and small pieces and grammatical tools and all of those won't do anybody any good when now you have to actually deal with the situation uh, and use uh, tools in a repertoire very flexibly. So um, every authentic communication transaction is not only proof of transfer and proof you need transfer. That's why for those precious 45 or 55 minutes the learner has with you, engage them in these kind of transfer tasks that have fewer to no supports, but have some kind of variation and complication to solve. Um, with transfer, it's all about solving a new problem, creating a very useful and unique product, and these consequently are also the hallmarks of creativity. The essence of what we want students to be able to do, always, is to chase unpredictability and handle the highest order of ambiguity in any context. Uh, because if, if we don't, if we don't engage them in tasks where they're expecting the unpredictable, where they're expecting this, um, this uh, inevitable unexpected. If they always are um, able to know exactly what, what they're going to get, our students um, start to expect and actually demand that you assess them exactly the way they were taught. And uh, the minute that diverges one, just one bit, just one we or they look at it like they've never seen it. Uh, they've never seen you. It could be two weeks or two months from the time they learned it. And usually what they will say to us is, you never taught us this. Um, the problem is not just in our content area, but it's in all of them. And, and the crisis of uh, promising the predictable goes all the way, you know, all the way up uh, K through 16 into graduate school into the world of work. Um, so this inflexibility and collapse when faced with flux, uh, it's just not how life is. Life has no scripts, so that's why the performance assessment tasks in the three modes, as best as they can, they need to be, they need to be ones that are brand new and novel to give students that skill and those tools. So um, we're now going to talk a little bit more about the design, and we are ready for poll question one. So yes, oh good, there's poll question one. How do you plan a unit? So you can choose, I design the final summative assessment first. I gather all vocabulary and grammar content, create activities and plan assessment last. Or I design summative IPA first and then plan formative ones to meet that goal. Is everyone done with the poll? Pretty close. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, we can we can move on ahead. Um, a world language curriculum unfolds these cultural contexts while solving the problems or creating the products in the three modes of communication. All right, so. All right, we have 13%. I designed the final summative assessment first. 
I gather all vocabulary and grammar content, create activities and plan assessment last. Yes, uh, or uh, design summative IPA first, then plan formative ones to meet that goal. Okay, um, so uh, by the by the end of this point, uh, I think you'll you'll see which way uh, which way we're talking about here. Um, I'm glad that some people said they designed the final final summative assessment first. We're going to take a look at the whole picture. All right, all three stages of backward design, and um, we only have a short amount of time today. But if anyone has any additional questions on how they'd like to do this for um, uh, for their class, for their unit. Uh, and for their for their program at the school, please let me know and follow up with me because there's a, there's a whole lot more to it. Uh, so let's uh, let's get going. The um, thank you so much for answering that poll. The three modes of communication aligning comparisons, connections, and communities back to these big ideas. And um, so we're looking again at that curriculum, how we unfold the intercultural context while solving solving problems and creating products for transfer. I made this visual design for intercultural competence, performance for transfer, and it is the three stages of backward design. Uh, I made this one uh, visual so people can kind of see what that flow looks like. In stage one, you identify those desired results. And uh, yes, you decide what you want students to be able to do by the end of the unit, and also what you want students to understand about the culture or cultures that they're learning about. Uh, how do these cultures speak to those pieces below the waterline on the, on the iceberg. What do they think about these perspectives? Um, what matters to them? And that's really what, what you use in order to be able to frame your task, to be able to give reason and purpose for your task. Immediately after you figure out what those themes are and big ideas are, and you develop the enduring understandings and essential question, then immediately to stage two, determine acceptable evidence. Now, these tasks are gonna show I'm going to determine how your students will show you what the learners will say to you in order to um, uh, show what they know and what they can do with tasks in the three modes. What problems can they solve? What products can they create? How can they solve these problems for you? And I know that you have another webinar on the three modes, but I'm going to give you a little introduction on what that looks like here uh, because it's immediately relevant to our, um, uh, to our discussion today. So from stage one to stage two, then you plan backward. Now you know how to plan your instruction. If you know what that final assessment looks like, if you know what you want them to do, and again, it really needs to be brand new, something they've never seen before, then you can plan instruction. And then ultimately stage three, plan those lessons that show what they can do. And those are smaller formative assessments that move them to performance assessment. And I think closer and closer to transfer. So that summative performance assessment is your ultimate transfer task. And then you move backward from there. And then, and only then, do you plan those lessons and smaller formative tasks all along the way. So you think you know where we're going in the poll question? <laughs> all right, we'll, um, uh, we'll move on from there. So, um, I'm going to give you an example in the spirit of backward design. I have a lot of examples and too many for this presentation. So again, reach out to me if you want some more. Um, so uh, here's an example on uh, stage one on these enduring understandings. Uh, students will understand that students in target language countries spend their free time in different ways. Extracurricular activities may not be part of school life and free time activities may be culturally defined. In looking at leisure time, the teachers that created this wanted to have understandings that would last really for the duration of their curriculum. And these understandings stay the same, uh, whether again, nine through 12 or seven through 12, how they're answered and how they're unpacked depend on the tasks that you do. So here are the enduring understandings. And now there are essential questions. What is leisure time? To what extent do family and friends influence the choice of leisure activities? Again, these are large, perhaps another level uh, and grade. They also take a look at what is leisure time and do something different. Uh, but these are overarching, enduring understandings, essential questions for your program. Again, for the goal of an articulated world language program. Stage two, okay, determine acceptable evidence. Here's your context for the summative performance assessment. Schools organizing this exchange program, you'll be spending a lot of time with the students at the program and you want to know more about how you might spend that free time together. This is a context that I give students day one of the unit or perhaps the night before. Uh, this makes sure that they know everything they're learning all along the way over the course of the unit 
will then go back to this context. Now, this it has to do with our summative performance assessment. Uh, it doesn't give too much away. It's kind of like the movie trailer for the unit, but they uh, see this right away and they know everything that they'll be learning and all those smaller assessments lead to this and they're all connected to this. All right, so uh, this is not made a secret. They get this right away. Uh, and now here's the summative performance assessment. Again, this is something brand new they've never seen before. All of those formative assessments that have been made uh, lead up to this one. Um, and this uh, stage two performance assessment was made first. The interpretive task, they had to read a target language school website or maybe some leisure guides, uh, weekend newspapers, uh, to find out about those extracurricular activities that are even available to students in the target language country. And this is important because a lot of students think, well, here's the activities that, uh, that I do in my country, I should be able to do the same thing um, in another country, and that's just not the case. So we wanted them to uh, to really investigate those culturally authentic materials and find those activities that happen uh, and what does uh, students actually do, what young people do in another country. Um, this leads then into the interpersonal task where they have to come to consensus and discuss what people usually do after school in the town and if they can do that in the target and decide then how they're gonna spend their time after school. Finally, the presentational mode task where they prepare a blog or a voice thread for other exchange students and they compare how teens spend free time in the United States and in the target language country. Um, you can see that uh, being able to do those comparisons on spending free time uh, really points toward that intercultural competence piece and may answer that question, what is free time? How does the culture or cultures view free time and leisure time? So again, it all goes back from the Enduring Understanding Essential Question Framer all the way now to the performance assessment and thus the smaller assessments that you develop. Now, stage three. This is where I put comparisons, connections, and communities for intercultural competence. This is where they really come together uh, in the form of these very specific can-do statements. So, I can make plan for free time activities, read schedules from local activity guides, Compare leisure activities and the target culture and their community. Maybe they want to discuss some preferences for food, leisure activities with host friends and family. I can extend an invitation to appear to participate in a leisure activity. Do you notice how all of these focus then on perhaps either cultural products or practices and again perspectives through these specific can-do statements, which I call performance assessment specific can-dos, these again will go back, not only to what was done in the summative assessment, but then what was done for determined uh, for uh, the desired results up there in stage one. So it, it presents a complete unfolding and a thread in an articulated curriculum. Let's take a look at these planning paradigms compared. And I've kind of made a side by side and looking at planning to practice, which was a paradigm really that focused on looking at grammar perhaps as your unit planner or your lesson planner to planning for intercultural performance and leading to proficiency. Um, there's a, a lot out there that talks about the difference between performance and proficiency. Performance dealing with those uh, those, uh, those pieces that are in the classroom or perhaps that are um, ones in, uh, in controlled settings. And proficiency is, well, your proficiency level out there in the real world and how you can actually perform. And I maintain that if you, if you develop transfer tasks with your students, it helps them move toward proficiency. Again, more and more novelty, which they're going to experience in the real world, and it helps enable those proficiency goals. So let's take a look. Um, planning for practice, well, um, we identified all the topics. We look at a whole buffet table of content. Usually there's a lot there, there's too much there, uh, uh, enough so that students will uh, forget as um, those pieces fall off the, that huge table of content um, because they're not uh, essentially using it. And then uh, uh, lists of grammar and vocabulary, create a whole lot of activities and people thought about culture, maybe if there was time. Uh, and assessment was thought about last. 
assessment was thought about uh, completely last, which left students to guess and then sometimes even the teacher to guess what was really essential and important. This planning paradigm really looks at assessment first, at performance assessment first, with these questions. What do I want the learner to revisit and remember about the culture? Five to seven years down the line after they've left you. These are the things that they're really going to revisit and remember and hook new information onto old. What do you want the learner to be able to do by the end? What are those tasks that you want them to be able to do? What are problems that you want them to solve? And then what do they need to move toward more novelty and transfer? So in a nutshell, you're seeing those three stages and those three points. What do you want them to revisit and remember? This is your curriculum framer with the intercultural perspectives. What you want them to be able to do by the end, whether it's the end of the unit or the end of your course or the end of your whole curriculum. And then what do they need them to move toward increasingly more novelty and then transfer? This is what comes into your smaller formative assessments down below. So to this particular planning uh, paradigm, we say be gone, all right? And we're gonna focus on this. So once again, stage one, identify desired results, determine acceptable evidence. Planning backward now, you can really see what you will do in the lessons in order to move them to better performance assessment for transfer. Inarticulated curriculum design looked at another way. I want you to imagine that your curriculum is like a tree. So enduring understanding is essential to questions are like the trunk of the tree. There's reoccurring themes that guide the different branches. Perhaps it's leisure time, health and welfare, family life, education. There are large overarching big ideas and themes. Uh, that you can use that your different culture and cultures can speak to. These branches are then are really the performance assessment tasks that appear every year and they change as students progress every unit level or year. Last then and only then come your tasks. These learning experiences, the formative assessments and instruction, you plan these only after your assessments are designed. These really will transfer to new situations that the learner will encounter later in your program and really long after they've finished. You can see more explanation of this in the article uh, in the NECFIL review. It goes through step by step how to, how to plan this way. So we're ready now for poll question two. Thank you so much. What drives your curriculum as a framework for design? Themes and topics, topics and grammar points, or themes driven by intercultural response? Thank you for answering this poll question for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. 28% themes and topics, topics and grammar points, themes driven by intercultural response. Okay, thank you very much. I always like doing these, uh, these polls and like to uh, reach out to uh, as many teachers as possible. Uh, so thank you very much. All right, so taking a look at it a different way, here's, um, here's a slide that I prepared looking at how to unfold this curriculum. Um, 
Uh, again, looking at identified desired results, stage one, determine acceptable evidence and plan learning experiences instruction. Um, we look at intercultural perspectives within the themes and here's how it works for us. Um, taking a look at that culture standard and developing enduring understandings and essential questions for intercultural competence up there in, in identified desired results, we use our communication standard for stage two, that summative performance assessment in the three modes, and then finally, comparisons, connections, and communities. This is what we use then to tie it all together, making those formative assessments and specific can-do statements. Uh, this is what I call performance assessment specific statements because I develop them directly from the tasks that we design. Uh, Actful and Successful has general can-dos that take a look at um, uh, those, uh, uh, what students can do um, in a general sense at each level in each mode. I've taken a look at it and made very specific can-dos that you can only make after you've designed the assessment. So it very is, it's very targeted and specific to what students can do based on the assessment that you designed for them. Um, and uh, we also take a look at intercultural transfer targets. So uh, we'll talk about that here. And when you read the article, you'll see the sample that's there in, um, in the, uh, the sample unit framer. Here's a, small, uh, here's a small sample for you. Uh, and I've taken a look at food and meal taking and health and welfare. This happens to be two uh, key topics and themes in the New York State syllabus. And um, I have just a sample here of enduring understanding and essential question. You can see those intercultural competence transfer targets. These came from the task. Um, so what you're seeing here is really stage one and, and those transfer targets in stage three. Uh, but these are all based on the performance assessments designed. Uh, so I can identify eating habits between cultures, compare food served in schools from target language countries in the U.S., and then finally explaining dietary preferences and concerns between cultures. Uh, this was a very interesting unit where they were looking at uh, the problems of diabetes in a number of different cultures and what those concerns are. So by reading authentic materials about, uh, about diabetes and the different initiatives, in various countries, uh, students were able to explain what those preferences and concerns are. Uh, you can see also for health and welfare, identify common remedies, health practices, uh, comparison, and then explaining why a culture may choose some remedies and practices over others. Uh, these are specific can-dos, as you can see, that point toward intercultural competence. So how do we design our curriculum backward for understanding these big ideas and themes? So which big ideas will reprise, enter, and exit throughout your curriculum and really the lifespan of the learner? These stay the same, as I was saying before. They stay the same and they recur over time. Um, uh, there was a question there about uh, novices or elementary learners that, uh, well, what, what can they do because they don't yet are, they're not yet speaking in the target language? Uh, they do not answer these questions. These are curriculum framer questions and understandings. So this is what you would use for your curriculum design. But how they demonstrate their understanding of this is through the tasks that you design. So even though in a K through 12 or ideally a K through 16 curriculum, you may have the same enduring understandings and essential questions, but how the students address them is going to be according to their developmental level and the tasks that you design. Um, so what changes then are then how they're answered. And they're answered through their summative tasks, through the formative tasks, and specific can-do statements that are designed from them. Your question always going, is going to be, what do you want the learner to remember and keep revisiting about these cultural perspectives? These understandings and questions, they really go beyond uh, very discrete facts or uh, grammar and vocabulary. They really focus on larger concepts and uh, in intercultural perspectives. So here's an example. We would say students will understand that. Extended families provide support and celebration across life's milestones and events. I created a side-by-side -side so you can see the difference between these enduring understandings and objective statements. Uh, a lot of teachers are used to making objective statements, uh, but you can see enduring understandings look quite different. Uh, but this is what might look like at task level down in stage three. Um, and the enduring understanding on the left. So if the enduring understanding is social activities are spent with people of all ages together, perhaps a task would be to identify popular social activities. And that would happen down in stage three um, after you developed your task.
Here's stage one and stage three at a glance. We talk about understanding of essential questions from themes. These repeat, they're recursive. Uh, they use cultural perspective to design them and they really last a lifetime. And here's an example of each. Then by the time you get down to stage three, you're writing those objectives. You have focus questions that actually the students are answering. Usually they're answerable by the end of the period. So focus questions and essential questions are very different. Uh, they focus on skills and facts and recall. You use your assessment tasks in order to be able to design them. And usually they're answerable by the end of class. So here's an example. And then what would be a focus question? This is an example that you'll also see in the article on health and welfare, but you'll see the enduring understanding of the essential question, and then across three levels, how students are able to contribute to this particular task on the health fair. Uh, so all students were able to contribute to the health fair depending on their particular, on their particular uh, development and where they are. This is nice because uh, teachers know that their entire cohort can be working toward a common project. They're all going to contribute differently according to their developmental level. So in determining acceptable evidence, uh, think for performance first. Uh, this is stage two. I know you'll be doing um, performance assessment in three modes soon, but I just wanted to show you uh, that it is indeed a cycle. Uh, interpretive mode tasks are always about acquiring new information, making inferences, organizing and posing questions. Um, that moves into the interpersonal mode task where they take that information and use that to be able to choose and come to consensus, ask questions and solve gaps. And then finally, the presentational mode task where they're applying information from two other modes, always to create a product or to solve a problem. Uh, so here's an example where you see the three modes and you see that these truly are solving a problem of some kind, whether they're writing questions about menu choices, uh, asking their partner questions and filling out a chart, likes and dislikes, and then finally the presentational mode where they're creating a product uh, and essentially solving the problem for the cuisine channel and they need a new concept restaurant. Uh, and they need uh, menus, and you have to plan menus appropriate for different people. So if all of your tasks prior to this were on um, what people's favorite foods are and their own likes and dislikes, to move students to transfer means, can you think about, a, can you think about somebody else's needs? Uh, this has to be a novel problem. So if um, in this example, teachers then said, well, here are different dietary needs, vegan, low carb, no dairy, et cetera. How would that menu look? So now they had to use that repertoire in order to make a culturally appropriate menu with some of these dietary needs in mind. So planning for transfer and looking at those objectives really is can they do something different? It's not enough that they can give back the information exactly as you taught them. They have to do something different with it. And here are the can-do statements that were derived from this particular performance task. Here's another example. Again, take a look at the can-do statements over there on the right. And I, I chose to give food examples because everybody does food units and that's very popular. Our can-do statements that are developed after you create the performance assessment task. A lot of people will take the can-do statements before they even design the task, and that, that's okay to get an idea, but you'll really get very targeted results if you prepare can-do statements from performance tasks that you design, and uh, also give these can-do statements to students day one of the unit or maybe the night before. Give them these so they know exactly uh, the type of uh, the type of task that, that they might be doing, uh, they'll know what their, their takeaway is, which is important. So even if the tasks are new, uh, they're completely novel and they, they don't know what it is, they will know this is their takeaway from it and it's very valuable. Okay, and the last one here, uh, this is a little more advanced on food and hunger. And again, you see the candy statements that come directly from those tasks. So here's a little, uh, a little task uh, for us deriving can-dos from the task. Um, coming to consensus about foods that are healthy and not healthy. Okay, it's a really great interpersonal mode task, so again, that you get the, uh, the can-do statement. I know we're coming up close on time, so I don't want to uh, uh, spend a lot of uh, time on this, but each one um, 
takes a look at, uh, well, what mode is it? And then can you develop a can-do statement? Watching travel video and checking off places you hear? All right, it's a great interpretive mode task. Preparing an itinerary for first-time visitors? It's a great presentational mode task. Using a store ad, you categorize food on the chart. If you said interpretive, you're right. Uh, two students ask each other questions to complete missing information. And then finally, watching the video and filling the graphic organizer with places to go, activities, best time of the year, a good interpretive mode task. So again, in, in developing these learning objectives, uh, really take a look at your task and develop those specific can-do statements for those. And here's a couple more. So here's the task. I students identify various places visited and assemble a collage based on the descriptions. It's a good interpretive mode task and a can-do. Students create Venn diagrams to illustrate similarities and differences. Display their diagram. And specific can-do statements. Possible activities they might do in the city and then decide what they want to do. Interpersonal, coming to consensus is so important. So yes, can-do statements talk about things to do, but also choose what to do and then plan when with a friend. Assemble electronic photo album. It's a great presentational mode task. And the can-do statement. In the materials that you will see uh, in the, uh, on the article, it talks also more about designing uh, backward and how it enables transfer. Um, and this is, uh, this is, uh, this is so important. So uh, the characteristics of transfer complexity, all needs to have a complexity of some kind. Uh, students need to do a task that has value beyond the classroom, beyond for classmates and for teacher, that has fewer and fewer supports, and then also novelty. It has to be a new, either new authentic material or for a different audience, or perhaps presents a different uh, type of challenge. In that article, you'll see a sample unit. If any of you would like to have blank templates, uh, please write to me and let me know if you'd like to uh, use one of these templates at your, uh, at your school uh, or for your classes. And some questions for discussion. So um, again, uh, part of your um, of your dig deeper, what are some challenges to designing and implementing an articulated curriculum? What are particular challenges in online language learning uh, in developing articulated curriculum? How might online language learning facilitate great transfer tasks? Uh, there's a lot of opportunities that I see that actually online language learners could, uh, could, could really do great transfer tasks and be quite successful in them. So these are very good questions for discussion. And then have you developed task specific can-dos after you design your task? And when do you give these can-dos to your students. So if we have a couple of minutes, uh, if there's uh, some questions, um, perhaps a question or two that the moderator wants to, uh, wants to choose, um, I can, somebody says I'd love to have a template, oh please write to me. Certainly, there were a lot of great questions that came through. And Jennifer, if you don't mind, would you be able to provide your email address just so we would be able to contact you? I definitely want to take you up on the templates. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Uh, this has really been uh, really exciting work. Um, as I said, I'm, so uh, uh, excuse me while I flip back to the first slide. Um, I've been doing uh, this work, as I said, since about 2003, 2004. Uh, on, on developing articulated curriculum uh, and using the intercultural perspectives as curriculum framer. Um, I, many people may have seen the presentations that I've done at APFIL or NEPFIL or different schools. Um, so if you have any uh, questions and you'd like some more information, please let me know. This is where you can reach me. 
Um, and certainly in that article that's in NECFIL Review, you'll see kind of a step-by-step -step there and some other pieces and tools that might be helpful to you. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. If, is, uh, if there's any other particular uh, questions, or I know we're coming up on time, it's a lot of information for a short amount of time. Uh, but I've been looking at your questions and they're, uh, they're excellent. So uh, if you want any more information, uh, please, um, uh, please let me know if there's any way that I can help you uh, with this design. Uh, what I can say is that it's terrific when you see teachers of different levels who might not have had the opportunity to work together before suddenly can by getting together to create these understandings and questions by looking at intercultural competence goals and no matter what language a student chooses at your school they can come away with those understandings and questions in common they are going to be different of course once they get down into your classes through the tasks that you design uh, but teachers all report that uh, now there's more uh, there's more cohesive um, and uh, more cohesive attention to design and to planning and to uh, performance assessment design. Uh, they're doing so with a great deal of care and intention. And you have uh, eighth and ninth and tenth grade working together. You have middle school and high school working together all toward this goal. Uh, so it's been a terrific work and I look forward to doing more and answering your questions. So feel free to reach out to me where, wherever you are. Um, thank you, thank you to all world language teachers. Uh, you're, all, you're all great, you're all heroes. So thank you very much. And thanks again to the NFLRC for this wonderful opportunity.